<laughs> okay, so we're going to get started. Thank you all so very much for coming. Um, I am Andy Horwitz. I'm the Assistant Dean for Experiential Education here. Uh, so that means I have sort of administrative responsibilities for uh, the totality of our experiential education requirements uh, or offerings, many of which we're going to be describing today. The good news is we have an awful lot of these offerings. The bad news is that means there's a lot to try and cover today, so in some ways we're going to be doing a little bit of speed talking um, just to try and give you a broad introduction to the concepts and the things that you need to know are out there, um, but by all means, if you want to know more about any particular program that we're describing today, a uh, part of what we're doing today is introducing ourselves and giving you the opportunity to sort of figure out who it is you would talk to to get more information about a variety of the things, okay? So um, what we're talking about is our clinics and our clinical externship programs. So um, what's the difference between a clinic and a clinical externship? So generally speaking, the concept of a clinic involves a member of our, a full-time member of our faculty serving as the attorney of record uh, and students working with that professor uh, and students being largely individually responsible for handling their own cases. So those programs are run entirely in-house, why we often call them in-house clinics, uh, because the entirety of the program is housed at the law school and uh, the lawyer handling the case is both a faculty member, the lawyer of record, and your teacher uh, and supervisor. Uh, a clinical externship has a very different model. So students are out in some kind of a law office, a judge's chambers, a corporate counsel office, any of a variety of uh, other kind of offices where lawyers practice law. The supervisor is a lawyer who is employed by that office, not a faculty member at the law school. Uh, and then there is a component seminar that is taught by a member of the faculty here at the law school. So the work is being supervised by an external lawyer uh, whose job it is is to work with you and supervise you, with you as you work with them on their cases. Uh, and then you come back to the law school, sometimes remotely by sort of electronic means, but in any event, participate in a seminar component uh, that's in that program. And then the third column is one unique program that we have that is sort of an amalgam or a hybrid of those two, so we call it a field clinic. Um, it is a clinic in the sense that the lawyer of record is the supervising attorney and also the teacher of the classroom component of that program, but it is uh, different from our clinics in that the professor who you're going to meet today is a member of our adjunct faculty, but really works full time at the law firm of Chisholm, Chisholm and Kilpatrick, which is where that program uh, is largely housed, although some of the work also happens in our clinical office uh, up in Providence. So broadly speaking, those are the differences between these uh, programs. Okay, who's, am I clicking? Are you clicking, Grizel? Okay, next one. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, did we skip one? Wait a minute. Yeah, you need to go back. Uh, you need to go back. I think maybe it will, you had gone to the next slide and I didn't look okay. okay. Get it. It's not, no. There it is. No. No. Before that. Side. So you get this one. We did that one. And the next, next one is this there one. There you the go. Okay. So what's the commitment? How does this work in terms of credits and in terms of hours? So all of our in-house clinics, the three clinics being criminal defense, immigration, and business startup, uh, are for eight academic credits. There's no variability in that. That's the program. It's an eight credit program. You are expected to devote uh, approximately 20 hours a week. The nature of the work tends to vary because we're dealing with real clients and real cases. So sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But on average, that's what it is. Those are all graded credits. They're graded as one unity, so you get one grade for the entire experience. The externships 
have a great deal of variability in terms of the number of credits you can uh, seek. You can work in a field placement, that office where the other lawyer works, two, three, four, or five days a week. If you're doing it five days a week, we call that a semester in practice, and that becomes the only course that you're taking during that semester, is that full-time experience in an externship setting with the two-credit uh, classroom component. So the field work, the work that's supervised by the external lawyer, uh, is graded on a pass-fail basis. The two-credit seminar that's uh, taught in conjunction with each of the clinical externship programs is a two-graded credit uh, seminar. Um, again, the field clinic is a little bit of an amalgam. It's less time, 15 hours a week is the expectation, six credits, but much like the other clinics, there's no variability in that. You're in for six credits or you're not. That's the credit load. And that includes the, you know, the entirety of the six credits are great. Okay, sorry. Now, okay, so semester in practice. So I've mentioned we have the possibility of doing an entire semester of law school in an externship setting. And that can be done here in Rhode Island, or it can be done remotely is the word we use, but really anywhere in the country or even anywhere internationally. We've had a couple of students do it internationally. So what happens there is you're participating in the two credit seminar by a program called Zoom. It's sort of the equivalent of Skype. Uh, and uh, you're doing that live at the time you know, that you're all participating with your classmates. Um, we have a couple of specialized versions of a semester in practice. One is Washington DC semester in practice. We have a former tenured member of our faculty who left our faculty a number of years ago, now works and lives in Washington DC. And he runs this program for us every spring. So if you do a DC semester in practice in Washington DC, you wind up with a live classroom component down there taught by Professor Zlotnick. Uh, but in any other respect, it really is the same as our other programs, each of which any of the externship programs you can do as a, a, a semester in practice. The other specialized version I'll come back to a little later is the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program. We're one of very few law schools outside of New York State that participates in this program, but it's not only designed for people who want to be in New York. What it allows you to do is take the bar exam in February of your third year of law school. So you take the bar exam before you finish law school. And then from March through May of that third, you know, third year spring semester, you're in a full-time externship, which can be in New York. It can also be other places, here or elsewhere. And then you wind up graduating, technically not in May with your classmates, but in June. But when you graduate in June, if things went well on the bar exam, you are basically immediately ready to be licensed to practice law. New York is a uniform bar exam jurisdiction, so it is transferable after you've taken that New York bar to other jurisdictions. So that's another interesting program that we offer. If you want to participate in any of these semesters in practice, it requires a lot of planning. So you want to figure this out much, much sooner rather than later. It involves a conversation with me because I need to sign off on it, which is really about trying to give you some counseling and planning assistance. The other kind of counseling and planning assistance you should absolutely seek if you're thinking about a semester in practice is with Brittany Raposa, who is here to sort of give you guidance about thinking through ways in which uh, what you're doing may implicate bar exam prep and the kind of planning you want to do around that. Okay, so um, per law school rule, the maximum number of clinical credits that you can take, and clinical credits has a very specific definition in our handbook, is 20. So that number wasn't arrived at randomly, it was arrived at with this in mind. What we want to enable students to do who want to do it is to take any of these combinations two of our in-house clinics, an in-house clinic or, or the field clinic, a clinic and what we call advanced clinic, coming back to a clinic for a second semester for a lighter credit load, 
a clinic and an externship, which can include doing a clinic and a semester in practice, right? But if you are doing a semester in practice, that is going to use all of your externship credits that are available under our rules. So you can do two different externships, but you can't have one of them be a semester in practice, New York Pro Bono Scholars, DC semester, right? Because that's going to use all of the externship credits that you're allowed. Right? So likewise, if you're thinking about doing an externship over the summer, that's going to take you out of the possibility of doing a semester in practice because you can't take that many of those kind of credits. Um, you can return to an externship for a second semester. Uh, again, often for fewer credits. Um, if you want to do an externship that requires eight or more credits, which really translates to four or five days a week, you're going to wind up talking to me, again, for similar reasons. It's really about planning, about trying to make sure that you've thought through the way in which this implicates your law school education uh, and bar prep and a variety of other things. Okay. So, I've mentioned already our three in-house clinics, criminal defense, business startup, immigration. I've made reference to the field clinic, which does veterans disability appeals work. We'll talk about all these individually. And I don't need to read the list for you, you can see, but we have a very extensive group of clinical externship programs available, and we're going to try and introduce you uh, at least briefly to all of those programs as we go. Okay, so I'm done, at least for my part, until we come back to the Criminal Defense Clinic, and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Gonzalez. Hi, I'm Debbie Gonzalez. I'm the director of the Immigration Clinic, uh, and the Immigration Clinic has three components. First one is uh, class time. So we meet Mondays and Wednesdays from 2 to 3.40, which means that as soon as this meeting, as soon as I'm done talking, I'm leaving because I have to go to Providence. <laughs> but if you have any questions, my email's there, dgonzalez at rwu.edu. Feel free to email me. I'm in Providence just about every day. So if you come to Providence and you want to just chat with me, come on in at any time. And so long as I'm not in class or with the client, um, I'm happy to meet with you. Um, so the substantive class really covers everything substantive in immigration law. We do that during the first half of the semester. So for the first, I don't know, six to eight weeks, all you're getting is law in, during class time. This semester I have tried to put um, case rounds, which is a class wherein we discuss our cases. At the beginning of the semester, it seems to be working out well. I'll try to do that next semester, too. A lot of that's depending on uh, student availability for us to have an extended class in the beginning of the semester. But that's class by class, semester by semester, so don't worry about that. Class time is 2 to 3.40, um, Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, the second component, uh, by the way, you don't have to take immigration law. If you take it, it's helpful, good for you. If you don't take it, don't worry about it. I'm going to teach you what you need to know um, for you to be able to represent your clients. So then the second component is client representation. You're all going to get real clients, real cases that are in immigration court right now. Um, to give you a flavor of what we're doing this semester, uh, we are filing a habeas corpus in federal court next week in mass. Um, I'm waiting for a Board of Immigration Appeals decision, which I have full expectations will be denied. That means, <laughs> that means we're going to the First Circuit. Um, I have two trials going on this semester. Um, for asylum. I have two motions to reopen on Southeast Asian clients who have criminal history. So that's a flavor of the work that we're doing at the clinic. We are very busy and if you are really interested in helping clients out who find themselves in immigration proceedings, um, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, that client representation means just what you see there. You're the lawyer. I treat you as the lawyer. Um, it, I treat the clinic as a small law firm, which is much different than sitting in a classroom in front of a professor that's dictating to you what they want you to learn. Um, this is more of us working together to find the best resolution for the client's case. Um, that means you're developing the theory of the case. That means you're meeting with the client. You're preparing affidavits. You're preparing pleadings. You're going to court and you're making the arguments that you've come up with in front of the judge to be able to convince the judge. You are the lawyer. I'm just behind you, kind of like, you know, pushing you. I'm your safety net. I'm going to be there to help you so that you don't feel like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you're going to know what you're doing by the time you're there. Don't worry. 
Um, and then the third component is computer community service. I'm a firm believer that every lawyer should provide community service because we have a privilege of becoming lawyers. This is a privilege to be this. And so I require every student to do either know your rights presentations or consults at the Wyatt Detention Facility, which is here in Rhode Island. Sometimes we'll do community um, know your rights presentations and or consultations with clients um, who need help or just want information. Um, I am also, I meaning the clinic, is a member of the Rhode Island Immigrant Coalition and we do tons of work with other NGOs in the state. There's always meetings going on. Um, to give you an idea, this semester I've been working uh, and I had a student come with me to DCYF where we review DCYF files to be sure that the kids that are placed in DCYF have all of their proper documents so that either when they go out on their own or when they're reunified with a parent, they know where their documentation is and they have everything in order when they're ready to go to college and that sort of thing. Um, we also do uh, immigration consultations with the Rhode Island PD's office. The Rhode Island Public Defender's Office in Rhode Island does not have uh, an immigration attorney. We are their immigration attorney. So when they have, that reminds me, I have to respond to an email. Um, <laughs> um, um, I'm sorry, I just like thought about this email and I had a brain fart. Um, so anyway, so, so we do that and, and students do that. So it's the student working with the public defender. We collaborate with the criminal defense clinic. Sometimes the criminal defense clinic will have clients that have immigration issues. So the students in the criminal defense <coughs> clinic and immigration clinic collaborate to find the best resolution for um, the, the criminal case that will affect the client the least in immigration court. Um, I think that's pretty much it. If you have other questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm uh, not here because I'm leaving, but feel free to email me. Thank you. Okay, so Professor Ahern was not able to be here today to talk to you about the Business Startup Clinic, but there is a video that we're going to show you. Hopefully. I'm Kate Ahern. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person with you today, but I'm excited to tell you about the Business Startup Clinic, which we refer to as the BSU Clinic or the BSUC. The BSU clinic is our transactional clinic, transactional generally meaning that we don't participate in litigation or court hearings. Instead, we help small businesses and nonprofit organizations with their transactional matters. This is an eight credit clinic. There is a prerequisite required. You have to take a business organization's class before you take the clinic. And there is like the other clinics, a class component, as well as your experiential component. So on the class side, you're learning substantive legal issues like a little brush up on contracts. Um, you do interviewing training, you do counseling training. Uh, we discuss ethics. We discuss business entities and nonprofit organizations, for example, to build on the work that you've had in law school up until that point. Our clients are generally small businesses, usually entrepreneurs who are just getting started, but we do work with nonprofit organizations as well. And we help them with a variety of work. So for example, we often have entrepreneurs that will come to us and want to know what type of business should I form? Is it a corporation? Is it an LLC? How do I make that decision? And we counsel them through that decision-making process in addition to helping them actually form those different entities if that applies. We help them with contracts as well. And we also help with intellectual property work. Our clinic is part of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office clinic program, and so our students are able to work with clients directly on intellectual property matters. We also partner with a faculty advisor who is an intellectual property practitioner out in the community and who works directly with our students as well. We also do uh, nonprofit work. So for the nonprofit clients, we help them with nonprofit specific work, but also general business work that applies to all sorts of organizations and is also applicable to nonprofits. We also are out in the community doing other types of work. So for example, students will generally do presentations in the community for nonprofits whose clients are similar to ours. So nonprofits who serve entrepreneurial clients, the students will go out and give presentations. And that's designed to help those folks 
spot issues, legal issues that they should be worried about in their business sooner before it becomes a stumbling block for those businesses. We also participate in other types of activities as the opportunities arise. So for example, some nonprofits have entrepreneurial competitions or other events that we will attend, and those vary based on the semester and what is going on in the community. You may have noticed a theme in a number of those photos. The students in that clinic tend to eat extremely well uh, because many of the businesses that that clinic services are uh, come out of or connected to an organization called Hope and Maine, which is a food industry entrepreneurial shop that's uh, set up in Warren. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about the Criminal Defense Clinic. Uh, well, okay, we won't worry about the slide. I'll just keep talking. Right. So uh, I'm the director, that's sort of my day job outside of my administrative stuff, is I'm the director of the Criminal Defense Clinic. And so what the Criminal Defense Clinic does, very analogous to what Debbie Gonzalez was describing in the Immigration Clinic, we function as essentially a mini public defender's office, where I am technically the attorney of record in all of the cases that we handle, but the model is very much that you are the attorney handling the case. Right? I have very little direct interaction with the clients by design. The design is that the client needs to see you as the lawyer and you need to see yourself as the lawyer. And so you begin each case with an interview of the client just as a lawyer in practice would. Uh, you investigate that case both research-wise but factual investigation, something we teach you very little about in law school but is critical to what happens in real life when you're litigating cases. Uh, you then are the person who is responsible for counseling this client through the decisions that he or she needs to make about how to proceed. You then are the one who's going to negotiate these cases with the prosecutor. And if we don't get to a resolution and the case uh, is scheduled for trial, it's you who will try the case. I am always present in court anytime we appear with a client in court. So I'm certainly sitting beside you when you're trying that case, if it goes that way you know, with a lot of sort of jabbing you in the ribs with my elbow and passing notes, but you are the one who is responsible for trying that case. As Debbie suggested, you'll be plenty prepared before we allow anyone to get to that scenario. So we handle um, a, a sort of fairly common looking misdemeanor caseload. All of our cases are misdemeanors outside of some civil work that we do at the Rhode Island Traffic Tribunal. So in the district court where we do misdemeanor work, about a third of our cases are cases involving allegations of domestic violence in some way, shape, or form. About a quarter of our cases are allegations of driving under the influence. Uh, and then we have a variety of other misdemeanors, possession of marijuana over an ounce, because under an ounce is now civil. Uh, simple assault, resisting arrest, disorderly conduct, obstructing a police officer, shoplifting, uh, other kinds of larceny, a variety of cases that look like that. At the Rhode Island Traffic Tribunal, which is the statewide traffic court, we do a lot of cases involving refusal to submit to a chemical test. So when you are arrested and suspected of driving under the influence, the police will ask if you will submit to either a breath test or a blood test. And you have the right under the law to say no, but if you say no, you'll be charged with this civil offense that's actually quite a serious offense in terms of its consequences. A mandatory minimum loss of license of six months, fines and costs that are well over $1,000, a variety of serious consequences. People at that stage in that court have no legal right to appointed counsel because it's not a criminal offense. So we do a lot of work over there, sometimes in conjunction with the Public Defender's Office when they're handling a DUI, sometimes it's our own DUI that has come with a refusal. Those are really good cases for us because they're kind of complicated and they are more likely to go to trial than your average criminal case. I want people who are thinking about participating in this program to, to know at the get-go the likelihood that you will try a case is very small. That's what our criminal justice system does. 95% of charges in the criminal justice system are resolved with some disposition other than a trial. And when you're talking about misdemeanors, the percentage of cases that go to trial is even less than that. So 
You may have the opportunity to try a case. You certainly will have the opportunity to work cases up as though you're going to try them. And we do a lot of simulated work, so you'll get a lot of work on your trial skills. But I don't want somebody to come into the program because they want to try a case. Uh, that really may not happen. Okay, so um, there is a prerequisite. You have to have completed trial advocacy before the semester that you want to be in the clinic. So, you know, we're taking applications, we'll get to this later, but we're taking applications in this round for both fall and spring of next year. So it's not a problem if you plan to take trial advocacy in the fall to apply for the clinic in the spring, as long as your application makes clear that that's the plan. Um, as I said at the beginning, we expect roughly 20 hours a week of work. Um, the way cases are assigned in the district court, they stay on a particular day. If a case is handled on a Monday, it'll always be handled on that Monday. So there's some work we need to talk about in terms of your class schedules to make sure that you have at least three days a week that are largely free from other classes so that you are free to be in district court and handling your cases. Um, so uh, I think that's enough for now, but by all means, if you have questions, if you're interested, as you should with all of the folks you're going to hear from, you should uh, ask us questions. You know, reach out to us by phone, by email. We're all very happy to give you more information about our programs. Okay, so next uh, should be Dana. Yep. Hi. My name is Dana Wiener, and I run the Veterans Disability Clinic. So how many of you have ever heard of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims? <laughs> Nobody, wonderful. Well, <laughs> Maybe one in the back? <laughs> so uh, there's a specialized court in Washington, D.C. that um, specifically handles uh, veterans' disability appeals. It's a federal court. Um, it's right next to the First Circuit, if any of you have ever been down there yet. Um, the court was established in 1989, so it seems like it's a little bit older than most of you, but not much. Um, so it's a really exciting area of law to get involved with because it's constantly changing, um, rules are emerging, um, you know, laws are being clarified or overturned, and um, because this whole area of law is so new, there's just a lot of change and a really great opportunity to be involved in that. Uh, so with the clinic, the semester is divided into two halves. The first half of the semester um, involves getting assigned a client case. And so um, you'll work on that case, get the entire appellate record, and you'll work on um, developing the theory of the case. Uh, so this semester we have students working on um, cases uh, for denials of increased ratings for veterans with PTSD. We also are working on um, cases for denials of special assistance for veterans who have become so disabled they um, can't protect themselves from the dangers of their environment. Um, and we have other cases about veterans who are unable to work because of their um, disabilities related to their military service. Uh, so you get the file, you you know work through it, and you help develop the theory of the case. You draft the memorandum that we submit to the court, and then you participate in the settlement conference um, with the attorney from VA's Office of General Counsel and the court's central legal staff. Um, throughout the semester, we'll also be going to the Veterans Treatment Court here in Kent County um, and participating um, in some experiences there and watching a graduation. We'll also be partnering with the University of Florida um, and their Veterans Legal Clinic to do a joint class with them. Um, we also have um, the opportunity to help um, work on court cases with them because there are no other clinics that specialize in this type of appellate work. Um, and so as more and more veterans clinics um, pop up, they've a couple of them have been reaching out to our clinic um, to help give advice on their cases. Uh, we also have the opportunity to have a class with the Counseling Center um, to talk about vicarious trauma. So if you're interested um, in pretty much any area of law <laughs> where you're dealing with other um, people's troubles, um, I say that people generally come to a lawyer when they're having difficulties, not because life is going so great. Um, so oftentimes we take on um, you know, our clients' problems or the trauma and it's hard to separate. So um, we will be dedicating a class on um, the skills of how to recognize um, that and how to deal with it and sort of tools that you can use in your practice going forward. Uh, and a couple other um, different guest speakers along the way. 
Um, and then for the second uh, half of the semester, the students work on a moot oral argument. So the uh, in the past, we've worked on um, whether drone operators can be considered combat veterans, um, even though they're not technically in the physical location of where combat's occurring. Um, we've looked into possibly changing that um, into some other um, interesting due process combat issues. Um, and so the final um, argument for next semester will um, be determined um, soon, but it's definitely going to be something related to combat. Uh, and so if you want to be a traditional litigator, you want to be in court every day arguing um, cases, uh, defending motions, whatever it is, this is not the clinic for you. If you're interested in um, sort of drafting complex arguments for briefing and working on um, your appellate writing skills as well as your um, appellate argument skills, then it's a, it's a great opportunity, a great clinic. It's also a really good experience to learn what it's like to be a first year associate as a law, at a law firm because that's um, how you're treated at the firm. So um, it's a really good opportunity. It's a unique experience. And if you have any other questions, I'm always available. Um, okay, so I'm Lori Barron, and I'm going to give you just a little bit of an overview of the clinical externship program, and then each of us is going to come up, there's many different programs, we'll each come up and tell you about our particular program. But so in general, just to emphasize again, the difference between clinics and externships. In the clinics, that, as you've heard, you have a full-time professor, with the exception of of Dana, who's more of a hybrid, but whose sole job is to teach you how to become a lawyer. For the most part, the cases of the clinic are the cases that the professor's working on <coughs> with his or her students, okay? And that, that is their sole job. In an externship, you have a busy supervisor who's a full-time lawyer who has a lot of other things on their plate. You might be like number 50 on their to-do list, mm -hmm. okay? So you're learning very different skills. You're learning how to manage up. You're learning how to get the supervision that you need. You're learning um, how a busy office functions. You're learning what corners might get cut um, when people are busy, as opposed to a clinic where you're learning the right way to do everything on your three cases or five cases, um, as opposed to doing parts of cases for busy lawyers in, a, in an externship. So it's a really different experience, and it really makes sense if you're interested in a particular substantive area, to do both a clinic and an externship to the extent that you can. So if you think you want to be a public defender, you're going to learn one thing in the criminal defense clinic, and you're going to learn something completely different if you work do an externship in a public defender's office. So they complement each other well. They're not duplicative or repetitive. Um, Signature parts, so all of our, all of our externship uh, programs are a two credit graded seminar and then anywhere between four and 12 um, field work credits. As you've heard, the maximum number of field work credits is 12, okay? Um, we all follow sort of certain, there's certain signature components of our externship program that all the directors do. So we all require you to create a professional development plan, really thinking about your goals, what you want to get out of this semester, um, and that's something that you talk to your supervising attorney about to make sure that you can achieve those goals while you're there. In the middle of the semester, you'll, you'll do a mid-semester self-evaluation, which is for your supervisor. We will come out, your director will come out and meet with you and your supervisor in a three-way meeting on site or via Skype or Zoom if you're far away. Um, and at the end of the semester, you'll get a final written evaluation from your supervisor. So really figuring out what you want to get out of the program, um, self-development, self-directed learning, evaluating yourself, these are all skills that you will learn in all of the externship programs. Um, a couple uh, points about the placement process. Your materials really matter. Your resume should be gone over with the folks in career development before you submit them to us because we are then sending them to an outside office. So in the fall and the spring, um, we will find your placements for you. So you apply to the program, you get accepted to the program. We will meet with you and talk about your placement options. We'll come up with a list and then we will send your resume, cover letter, writing sample, whatever the placement requires to the placement. You'll have an interview and then they get to decide um, yes or no. We are committed to you, so if you get rejected by the placement that we send you to, we'll find you another placement. Um, it works a little bit differently in the summer, but I'm not going to explain that right now because you'll hear that later. Um, 
we have evaluations in our office for many of the placement sites, and if you want to sort of get a sense of what other people have done, you can come to our office and see them. Um, I think now I'm gonna, we're going to go one by one with our different programs. So Professor Humber is going to talk about the Corporate Council. Hello everyone. So I am the director of the Corporate Council Externship Program as well as the Government Externship Program. So I'll just talk to you a little bit about the corporate program. Um, so as Professor um, Barron just mentioned, there are several components. So there's the placement that you'll be um, working at and then there is the weekly seminar. So you all are learning black letter law and doctrine, but what's really great about the uh, Corporate Council Externship Program is that when you are in your placement, you are learning how to really practice business law in a very busy setting. You are, what is even better, learning business acumen in those settings. Some things that you don't necessarily get exposed to, um, you know, in your sort of um, primary courses. So that's really a really great component of um, the Corporate Council Externship Program. You're learning how to be a professional in those specific spaces. So we have really great relationships with um, many of uh, next slide, please. Uh, many really great leading companies. So we have relationships with Fortune 250 companies, Fortune 500 companies, as you can see here, publicly traded companies, as well as private companies. Um, so really great relationships available for you, opportunities available for you. Um, so lots to choose from. What I like to share um, at this info session is some of the things that the supervising attorneys have said about our students at these placements, which is the fact that they love having you there. Um, they do get so busy and they really appreciate the externs because you add value to their business day, which is a very busy day. You take work off of their plates um, and they really appreciate that. So they really uh, enjoy having this program as part of their, um, just, uh, just working with our program. The other thing too, uh, we have another uh, smaller company we're in shipping. They have slow turnover because they're just a small private family company and they love having students just because it's a new face to see. Um, they literally see the same people for 30 years. Um, so they really love having you all there as a new fresh face um, and they want me to share that with you too. So, um, so come on to Moran Shipping. Um, okay, so just a couple different industries to mention to you that we work with uh, just to give you a sense of what some of our students are doing. There's the health law industry where we have a, you can get exposure to compliance work, um, navigating HIPAA laws, um, you can get a little bit of employment experience, you can get all of that in all of these, but these are just uh, specifically to these different industries, just a little taste of what you can get there. Being that this is the ocean state, um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to work in hospitality law. So you can work for uh, trade associations, um, the Rhode Island Trade Association in particular, hospitality association, excuse me, um, where you can work on vendor agreements, you can represent um, small businesses, one student um, last semester worked on a piece of legislation and drafted it from scratch mm -hmm. and that was on behalf of small business owners to help give them protections against food delivery apps that um, can create contract abuses sometimes that exist. So that is a, a really, and that could potentially have a nationwide impact because it's the first of its kind that one of our students drafted. So I think that's awesome. Um, so know that you can have a big impact in that way. Um, Sports and entertainment law is another one. We do have a relationship with the Red Sox. One thing I want to tell you all is that with the Red Sox, they prioritize Roger Williams students in the fall. So for any of you who are um, interested in the Red Sox, come talk to me as soon as you can so that we can think about the fall um, for that. Because when it comes to the spring, you're competing with more all New England schools, whereas in the fall, it's really just, they, they really prioritize us. Um, so just note that. The other thing I wanted to mention too was uh, about generalized practice. So what's really great about working in some of these companies is that you get exposure to many different areas of law. Some of the companies that have um, the generalized practice are Swarovski, Sensata Tech. You literally can work on anything from um, commercial contracts, marketing contracts, trademark, copyright issues, um, conflicts of law issues because there's a lot of international business partners that you could potentially um, have relationships with and negotiations with. So very interesting stuff happening there. Um, energy law, property law, so many things. So um, when it comes to the government, uh, excuse me, the uh, Corporate Council Actionship Program, there are no prerequisites. But there are courses that you can take throughout uh, your first and second year that can really help position you best when you're at the placement. So we can talk about those courses. I've created a handout 
for students that will help them sort of think through. Just to name a, uh, a few off the top of my head, certainly contract drafting. Our placements love it when our students take contract drafting. IP, accounting for lawyers, something that you all never thought you'd hear. <laughs> um, but accounting for lawyers is actually something that's really valued. I know that um, we have that uh, offered by an adjunct professor, so um, something to think about. And the other thing I wanted to mention, oh, are just some new exciting placements that we are um, working with. So one is U.S. Sailing. So that's right here on campus where you can potentially work with um, compliance issues protecting U.S. athletes uh, regarding Title IX issues, which is really interesting, and also working on company contracts for U.S. Sailing. Uh, Twin River Casino, they've been in the news quite a bit lately, but um, issues with Twin River Casino and IGT, just fun stuff, you can look it up. Uh, but we're working with them to get them as a placement. And also FM Global, which has um, an office here in Providence as well as Luxembourg. Um, so that's something that we're working with. I think I see someone in the audience who I'm working to get an international placement for. So um, really great opportunities. If you have any questions, I'll be here after and we can talk. Um, I think you might go next. Yeah. I think no. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to do a lot of bouncing. Back, back and forth. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Julia Wyman. Um, I direct the Environmental and Land Use uh, Clinical Externship. A lot of you know me as the director of the Marine Affairs Institute. That's my number one title here. Um, the Environmental and Land Use Externship is really a home for. Um, our environmental and land use students who don't necessarily identify themselves as just doing ocean and coastal. So I'll talk a little bit about the placements we have here, but please know that if you're interested in more broad or broad environmental issues or land use issues, this is a great opportunity for you. It doesn't have to be focused on our oceans and coasts. Um, so um, first I'll talk a little bit about our placement. So we are, as um, Professor Barron said, all of our externships fall into a similar pattern of how many credits you can take and the fact that you'll be in a seminar and then you'll have um, your placement. Um, we have several placements in the state of Rhode Island, either in nonprofits or in government agencies. Um, so some of those placements, the Conservation Law Foundation in Providence, um, the Attorney General's Environmental Unit, um, the Department of Environmental Management, um, the Providence City Solicitor's Office. Um, those are some standard placements we have, but I'm also very open to if students have other ideas for other placements that they'd like in Rhode Island, or if they're interested in doing a semester in practice elsewhere, I'm happy to work with you to explore opportunities for that. I will say a caveat on that is every single student that I have now counseled about a semester in practice has successfully gone on to do a semester in practice and has ended up in DC. Um, and if that does happen, because there are a lot of really great environmental organizations down in DC, I will happily um, help create the relationship for you to go to the DC semester in practice. Um, but if you're interested in going someplace else, you are absolutely welcome to do it through the Environmental and Land Use Externship Program. Um, so one thing that's a tiny bit unique about our program um, is in the seminar, um, we spend a good bit of time sort of learning how to be an environmental lawyer and dealing with some of the issues that are going to come up in your placements. So our placements, we have nonprofits, we have government agencies. You might be in a big office, you might be in a small office. Um, you're definitely going to be part of the team. Um, you're going to have to learn how to prioritize um, and manage up. I love that term. Um, and um, so we do a lot of discussion about how how to handle that in the environmental and land use context. Um, but then we also spend about half the class working on specific substantive issues related to environmental and land use. Um, and so we have a great textbook that has um, problems in it that, that we work through. And every semester I have students that come in, and it's already happened this semester, and said, I worked on this problem for class last week, and I had the exact same problem in my placement um, on Monday. And so it's, it's great to see that it actually works. Um, so we do do a component of actually learning environmental and land use law in class. Um, we do have some prereqs for um, this clinic. I think they're listed up there. Environmental law, natural resources, ocean and coastal law, um, land use, and I will also accept administrative law. It's a very important class, um, but you can talk to me if you don't have one of those prereqs. Um, we, we can talk about that. Um, this semester, or this um, externship program is also a spring-only semester, so think about that in terms of your planning. Um, 
And you also definitely want to think about it if you are someone who is interested in ocean and coastal issues and you're thinking about the joint degree program, um, it can be hard to fit the joint degree program and an externship placement into your time here at Roger Williams. So come talk to me early and we'll plan out and map out exactly how that should look. Um, now on to the sort of exciting part of it. Um, in terms of in your placements, what kind of issues are you going to be working on? Um, so right now we've got students, I'll just start with what we're, what we're doing now. Um, I've got students who are working on um, suing big oil for climate change, um, claiming that um, oil companies have caused um, uh, climate change issues that we're facing here in the state of Rhode Island, so trying to hold them accountable to that. Um, lead paint and drinking water, it's still a really large issue in the state of Rhode Island. Um, land use acquisition for the state, so how do we make, um, how do we properly acquire land to help um, promote some of our environmental um, uh, prerogative um, in the state of Rhode Island. Um, environmental justice issues, huge issue now and is going to continue to be a very large issue as we start to see much more climate change and people um, affected by climate change. So things like um, now that we have a lot more hot days in the state of Rhode Island, we have a lot of places in Providence that um, are essentially paved everywhere and you're going to see a spike in temperature and we see that kids have a lot more asthma in, in Providence. So what are, what are we going to do about that moving forward? Um, and then the plastic bag ban. Um, some of you may know that certain states um, have adopted plastic bag bans and Rhode Island has been sort of wrestling with it for a few years now. Will we see that? Um, we have it sort of on a municipal level here, um, but what, what will we do statewide? So those are some of the types of issues that students get to, get to work on. Um, and I think that that's it. I'll, I'll leave it there, but um, I'm available. I'll be here afterwards if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the placement. If you don't want to talk today, come stop by my office in 284. Happy to chat a little bit more. Okay, I am not Michael Yelnowski. <laughs> he could be here. And he um, directs and oversees this program. So the judicial externship program, at least at Roger Williams, is really unique because we have a very close relationship with our with our judges in the state. So as you can see, we have relationships, uh, you know, from the lowest courts to the highest courts, and all of these courts take our students. Um, they will welcome you into their chambers as if you are one of their clerks, and they will entrust you with, um, you know, memo writing, decision making. The judge may turn something over to you and say, "You decide how this should come out. Tell me what you think." The judge may not agree with you, and he or she will then decide what they want to do, but you will have real input into ju judicial process. You will watch lawyers in action, whether it's appellate or trial. You will understand how judges make decisions. You will probably come, up, come out of it with a mentor for life. It's a great thing to do if you might want to clerk when you get out of law school to see what it's like um, and help you think about what kind of clerkship you want and if it is for you. It's also a great thing to do if you know you don't want to clerk because you will never have that chance to see behind the scenes how decisions are made. So it's really a great opportunity. Um, for some of the judges, um, grades matter, writing samples matter. For some of them, they don't. So please don't select yourself out. If you're accepted into the program, you'll meet with, uh, with Michael and talk about the different options and then make a decision about where you want your materials sent. Um, the seminar is taught by two um, very funny, smart judges, so Justice Flaherty from the Rhode Island Supreme Court and Judge Smith from the Federal District Court. They are friends, they are um, collaborators, I think they disagree a lot, and I think it's a fun, lively, interesting seminar. Um, and then Michael will oversee sort of you drafting a professional development plan, he'll come to your mid-semester meeting and sort of oversee your field work throughout. Okay, do judicial. Um, <laughs> prosecution of government. I'll just back up. <laughs> okay, so similar to, um, I'm going to call it CCEP so I don't have to say corporate counsel action program anymore. So now you'll know it's CCEP. Similar to CCEP where you have one client, which is the corporation. For prosecution and government placements, you have one client, right? So for prosecutors, it's the citizenry at large. For government, it is either the unit or department for your state, federal, or local municipality. 
So that is where our uh, students are placed at these um, at different locations in different prosecutor's office or different government units um, or departments. So you can see here that we have, um, you can see some of the different placements here. I have a student right now who is actually, which is not listed here, but is working in Alaska um, at the legislative arm of the uh, local Anchorage municipality, which is very interesting. Uh, another student we actually have in Michigan who's working um, for uh, a municipality there. Um, and we have a student who is at the Governor's Executive Legal Council, and she feels like she's met literally every single person in the state of Rhode Island, <laughs> just because they're so well connected, and they know everyone. Um, so really great opportunities to understand what it means to be a government lawyer, um, really great opportunities for, for networking and understanding um, these different placements. A couple things I wanted to mention, for this uh, externship, there also are no prerequisites, but we can sit and talk about which courses could potentially give you those transferable skills that will be helpful in these placements. Um, and so a couple new placements that we're working to get um, are is the Rhode Island Department of Health. We've actually just added that to, uh, the, to as a placement. And also the Rhode Island Commerce, which is uh, essentially supports um, businesses, local businesses, and helps develop local businesses. So just a couple new placements that we're getting. But that gives you a sense of uh, the government and prosecution externship program. Here for questions for that as well. You'll see we're going to start talking much faster in the last <laughs> seven minutes. Right. So I'm going to try to take only two. So this is the public interest clinical externship. It's taught in the fall and the spring um, for next year. And um, this is really direct work with low-income clients. Um, this program tends to attract more students who want to go someplace else, so I tend to have at least a handful of remote students each semester. That sort of triggers, if it's going to be your last semester of law school, thinking about when you're going to do ALR, which is why we have Professor Raposa and Professor Thompson here. So the new rule is that you will take ALR in your last semester of law school, but for students who want to do a semester in practice in the spring of their 3L year, they will likely take ALR in the fall, but it is a consideration, and so you will meet with uh, Professor Raposa if you're thinking about a semester in practice as well. Um, we have students all over the place. Right now I've got a student in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, working for a public defender's office, and I have a student in San Diego, which is her home, doing work with um, immigrants in detention on the border. So she's in a detention facility a couple days a week. Um, um, one note about the seminar, it's um, the, uh, renamed it to indicate that I'm doing some new things in it. It's now called a social justice lawyering seminar, and that's really because I'm focusing a lot on the issue of race in, in our systems of justice for low-income clients. It seems to um, many of us that you can't think about working with marginalized clients unless you think about race, class, gender, and and the fact that our country was founded on slavery. So focusing a lot on that in the seminar in addition to all of the other things that I described before. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Susie Harrington Stephan to tell you about what we're doing this summer. So this is like camp. <laughs> stay away, stay with me. So the summer program, um, this summer will be taught by Professor Humber, but I'm helping make sure those of you who are interested get the information you need and the counseling before you decide whether the summer externship makes sense for you. So the first thing I want to make sure everyone knows is that no one else can do it, no one else or rising two L's. It's really open to students who are rising three L's or if they're students who are on a part-time schedule or maybe a little bit behind in courses, those are the folks that the program is open to, but no first years which are also called rising two L's. It's going to be a mixed group this summer, and that's not unusual. We usually have a mix of public interest students, government, environmental. We're going to have some corporate counsel in it. Really, the only types of placements that don't fit into this summer's program would be you can never work for a private law firm. We don't allow that. And judicial. Okay. So other than that, most placements um, would fit into our program. So no private law firms, no judicial. You can get paid, that's true with all of our externships, but for the summer, students are really in a better position usually to potentially get paid. So keep in mind whether that's a stipend or actually a paid position with, for instance, a corporate counsel department, that would count. It doesn't prohibit you from getting academic credit. For the summer, you can get between, uh, the, the max a number of credits would be eight, uh, the minimum would be uh, six, five, 
that would uh, be abuse. Four field work credits. Thank you. Yeah. Six. And six. So six, that's right, six to eight. And that's a little different than last summer. That's why I want to make sure that everyone here knows that. So your max is eight. It's a 10-week semester. You meet every Tuesday night. I think it's going to be Tuesday with Professor Humber for two and a half hours. So this is not just getting academic credit for the field work. You have the same seminar component that you would in the spring or the fall. Um, weekly writing assignments, discussion-based seminar, but there's a lot of work associated with the seminar, and I just mentioned that because I think sometimes people think that the summer might be different. It's no different than our regular structured externship program. Uh, usually it means you're working three, four, or five days a week for 10 weeks. So there is no sort of two-day week option that would get the number of hours that you'll need even for our minimum number of credits. If you're interested in applying, Okay, so before you submit an application, you need to make a meeting with me. Um, that's a little different than the way Lori was describing it, where she, you apply and then she sort of places you. The summer is different because employers are different. A lot of them are accustomed to hiring summer interns on a more traditional summer schedule. But make an appointment with me sooner rather than later. There are a few specific corporate council placements that Professor Humber works with that are willing to take summer um, externs this summer. So if you come to me and we talk about sort of general counseling for the summer, I can then steer you towards professor, uh, to Professor Humber to make contacts with the corporate counsel departments. I think that's it. That's it for that okay. one. Thanks. So um, the DC semester in practice, I mentioned, it's really not fundamentally different from anything you've heard about, except that you wind up in DC. You can work for the government. We've had placements with our senators, with our congressmen. Uh, DC has so many places where lawyers are working and Professor Zlotnick who's our boots on the ground there will help you if that is something that you're interested in doing uh, you've got his email up here and he would be thrilled if you would reach out to him the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program I also mentioned earlier we're gonna skip this because we don't have time but if you want to see a video of Professor Zlotnick you can reach out to us and we'll show it to you. Um, the New York Pro Bono Scholars Program, I mentioned already, um, it involves lots of planning. It involves having a conversation with me um, and uh, the folks over here as well. I mean, this is just all about planning. And that's true, by the way, for pretty much everything we've talked about. You wind up taking the bar in February. You do 12 weeks of full-time pro bono work that does not need to be in New York. Um, and uh, that's basically how that program works. Um, so last, just want to sort of emphasize the application process, right? We do an application, it's coming now. Uh, you apply through Simplicity. You apply for any program that you might be interested in, right? So if you might be interested in four different programs, then apply for four different programs. We do an application period now for the entirety of next year because we want to really encourage people to plan. So think now about applying if you're interested in the spring of next year, particularly the programs that are spring only, but also any of the programs. Because if you wait until the fall semester of next year to put in your application for the spring, you might find that the program you most want is largely or sometimes completely filled with people who thought earlier and applied in the spring of the year before. Okay, so that's how that application process works. We will have another one in the fall, but you wanna get ahead of the game, you wanna think it through now, meet with the various folks you need to meet with, plan, ask your questions, and put in the applications now for anything you wanna do next year. I leave anything out of that? I don't think so. All right, so we're, we're at one o'clock on the button by my watch. Um, plan. And reach out to the directors if you have questions.